Okay, good afternoon, and thanks also for the very nice previous talk, which is also kind of an introduction to mine. I don't know how the, the order of the presentation was set up, but I must say it's quite very well thought. So, my name is Bernard Jack from Luxembourg, and I will be talking about how visualization can be helpful in the AI machine learning uh, domain. My personal background is in engineering and later on in visualization. So, my talk will be divided in four parts. First, a quick introduction. Next, I will talk a little bit about the adoption, the acceptance of AI, which seems to be also a persuasive problem in, in this session, but globally. And also the connection between AI and this, and I can how they can be complementary to each other, and finally, a conclusion. So the first question, a little bit provocative question, do we really need AI? I would say yes, in some domains, for some specific tasks. Not for everything, not everywhere, not for everybody. Do we really want a wider use of AI? Yes, but why it helps? Where it doesn't help, why do we need it? Does it require a larger acceptance of AI? Yes, but we should, it should not be imposed to citizens, to customers, to people against their will. We should also respect, to some extent, the, what the people want. And finally, do we need the support of policymakers to foster AI development? Of course, AI has become a topic of public interest. As we have seen in previous talks, there are a lot of people thinking about what would be the rules, what would be the regulation, what would be the standard, what would be the, the things we should, let's say, integrate in our thinking before deploying AI at a large scale. Now, the purpose of this talk is can visualization help from this regard? So, if we look at other disruptive technologies, most of the time for a technology to last, to be used on a large scale, it requires acceptance by the users, the citizens, customers, people who want to, the willingness to pay, public bodies, business actors, regulators. So there's a lot of people to be convinced in order to have a wider lasting large scale use of a technology. And the same probably applies to AI which is also another kind of disruptive technology. So what is important to point out is that acceptance is not understanding. Those of you who have taken a flight to come here probably are not very much expert in our dynamics, turbine technology, embedded systems, everything that makes that a plane is flying in a safe manner, but nevertheless you took the flight. And it's not a problem meaning that in many technologies, we're using them, we're accepting them, but we don't understand them, how it works. So the first statement is that we don't need to understand how technology works to use it. And there are numerous examples. Now, there have been people studying the acceptance of a technology for many decades. This is the term model is very well known. It has been refined, but nevertheless, it's one of the, let's say, seminal papers in the field. And Davis tried to understand what are the variables that leads to the real use of a system in technology. And if you look at this model, understanding the technology is not a variable, but the usefulness, the ease of use of the system is important. And even more important, the perception of the ease of use, the perception of the usefulness, which drives the acceptance of a system. So perception is key in the acceptance of a new technology. Of course, it's quite obvious today that AI will not be widely deployed without a decent level of trust. And trust is directly linked to the positive or negative consequences that the people expect from this, the usage of this technology. So now, if we're talking about trust, trust, uh, we can have a direct or indirect way to build trust. The direct way is that there are for sure some people in the room, 
you exactly know how the technology works because you're an expert in this technology and you have the right skills to understand it. Let's, in AI, you are an AI expert. You have the right level of AI literacy, so you know exactly what deep learning is, so you trust it because you understand it. But for the majority of people, it's an indirect trust, meaning that you don't trust the system because you understand it, but you trust the system because you trust a chain of people, bodies, processes that should give the right level of trust that you expect to use the technology. So you trust what I call proxies, proxies bodies, proxies people that may be policymakers, NGOs, domain experts, civil servants, or AI experts if you have access to them. So very likely, like in most of the technologies, what we need to have a wider acceptance is to build this reliable, trustworthy chain of proxies between the citizens and the AI system. Now, an interesting question could be, okay, in, in this, let's say, system where people are talking uh, with each other, so the proxies, you have the domain experts. So typically we have seen this morning, example in medicine, but also we have been talking in this session about justice. So domain experts are typically doctors, lawyers, journalism, engineers, if you're talking about autonomous cars, agronomists, if you're talking about smart agriculture, bankers, if you're talking about giving advice for investment, energy experts, renewable energy experts, marketing professionals, there's a lot of people that are experts in a domain, but not in AI. And you have this kind of complex relationship between, let's say, policymakers, NGOs, people doing lobbying, ex civil servants, and AI experts too. And key question are, how much do the proxies understand AI? Because they are the, the interface to the final user. So if the proxies don't understand AI, how should they be able to explain to the normal people what it is? How do they interact with each other? So all this complex relationship between all those proxies, how does it work? And how do they interact with the AI expert? We have seen that there's a lot of initiative across the globe in Europe about all those reports that have been reported in this session too which basically means interaction between AI experts and some other people. And once again, because I'm this guy, how can visualization be useful? So basically, uh, there's two major let's say, questions that are now studied in the interaction between this and machine learning. One part that I will not talk about today is the use of machine learning to use or to, let's say, produce better visualization. There are people working on it. I will not report on it today. I will talk about how visualization can help the use of machine learning, which is the other basic question. And in fact, visualization has been used for decades to explain, convince, communicate. It's a very official way to go directly to the brain based on, let's say, cognitive psychology, we know that the most efficient bandwidth to the brain is, more, is the eye and the vision. It's, so we can use visualization for identifying biased data, to choose the type of model we want, to fine tune models, to trace back the, the rationale of a decision, to explain the overall behavior of a model. There's many, let's say, questions that could be, let's say, supported by a right visualization. And as you uh, have understood for sure, proxies people are a key target population for this. So when we're talking about this and AI, we can start by thinking about what we want to visualize, for whom? Extremely important question, because everybody has a different background, different literacy in many things, and why, so which kind of task we want to support with these graphics. So we can start with, we want to show the internal mechanics of a machine learning model. So this is the purpose. So what is internal mechanics? Another approach would, can be that I want to visualize a surrogate model of the real machine learning model. It's not the same, but it's something different that is close enough to the real one. 
you can also want to explain a specific output. I will give some examples later on. And finally, you can also want to visualize kind of a sensitivity of the model to, let's say, various kind of data sets you can uh, feed the model with. So let's start with the first step. To visualize how really uh, the, this model is uh, working. So it's just like in a car. You want to understand the engine. So these are some examples and some recent papers about it. And this is a paper in uh, 2019. Uh, uh, yes. And the, the question was that those authors wanted to visualize a uh, deep learning model. So it's quite complex. You have the data flows, and if you're expert in deep learning, you could understand it. If you're not, it starts to be quite difficult. And so the question of this kind of work is that it's okay for AI people, good, but not for proxies people. Because if people don't have any clue about what a deep learning approach is, does it make sense to, say, to show them uh, the graphs of data within this deep learning? They don't even know what it is. So possibly the target population of this kind of visualization is AI experts. Now, let's take another example. This is one coming from my institution. And what we try to visualize is a random forest and try to show which are the variables that are important in each and every tree and how they are aggregated together in, in the forest. Okay, it's working more or less fine if you have an AI machine learning background. To some extent, if you are a domain expert, depending on the domain experts, but for sure not for the general public and for sure not for most of the policy makers. So once again, okay for AI experts, for some of the proxies, depending on the background, but not for everybody. Now, another case is you want to visualize, you forget about the engine, you want to build a model that is close enough and more explainable, easier to understand than the real one, the segregate model. And there have also been paper, people that are recently let's say, publishing about that, like Rule Matrix, published last year. And in this case, what they did is to, in fact, mimic the behavior of a deep learning a neural net model with rule-based. Rule-based are easier to understand. If then what happens, it's, let's say, easier for most of the people. And uh, so they built this system. It was in, in healthcare, uh, uh, this uh, example. And OK, for some proxies, it's better, because at least the logic is easier to understand. Of course, the key question is how close it is to the real one. So the question about how close the surrogate model is to the real model that is used to, for instance, compute prediction is important. But at least we have kind of an entry point to the explanation of what is uh, produced by the model. Now, another case could be to visualize the relationship between the data you have put in the model and the output. And if I take uh, some example I've heard in, in this session and also this morning, we have been talking about predictive justice or else care. And typically, in this case, you, the judge, you have somebody in front of you, uh, you have kind of a system, predictive justice system, that tells you, okay, how, what is the probability of this person to be a recidivist <coughs> if, you, if you're in the justice, or you're a medical doctor and you have a patient in front of you, and you want to know why this AI-based systems is suggesting that this person is this or that uh, disease. This is the kind of example. So, and this is another paper that have been published a few years ago. It was really in the medical field and the idea was to say, okay, I compute the probability of a patient to have the flu. I come to the conclusion that yes, he has the flu, why? And try to find the variables, the future, that confirm the uh, prediction and the ones who were against the prediction. And the, the ones who were against the prediction are also important because you let finally the doctor to say, okay, based on those two parameters that say this patient has the flu, but this other parameter that says the parameter doesn't have the flu, I use my experience, my internal knowledge, my tacit knowledge, which is not in the data, and I take a decision. But at least I'm guided. I keep the control, but I'm guided and I have a kind of a 
an easy way to understand why this prediction was made. Also with, in this case, histograms and all the kinds of visualization. So perhaps for more proxy people, it starts to be better because it's, let's say the interface, the UX is quite simple. It's not that difficult. Of course, the model behind can be very complex. And also for ethical reason, at least in this case, the final decision is left to the medical doctor. So it's not an automatic process. Now, let's take the, the same example. So justice and medicine. If you, not a judge, but you're the ministry of justice, your role is different. If you're the ministry of justice, you are asked by somebody to say, I want to deploy this tool in all the courts of my country. So what you want to do is to see how much this system is, let's say, trustworthy, not on a single case, but globally speaking. Same if you, in, in the medical world, you're the minister of health, and somebody told you, okay, I want to deploy this system in all hospitals. Shall I say yes or no? So it's a diff different granularity in your decision. And for instance, there have been very, very recent work working on this field, and the question is more or less a generalization of sensitivity analysis. So how much a given model is sensitive to perturbation in the input? As we know, there have been a lot of talk about it. Of course, if you want to model something that is dynamic and you do it with a static model, you have a problem because the, the reality is changing, but your model doesn't. So there's all this question about how evolving dynamic machine learning models could be. Of course, there are people uh, thinking about it. And also, it may be the case that the data that have been used to train the model are not fully, let's say, representative of the reality. So how much sensitive they are to perturbation that may arise and what would it mean in the output. So these people have been also working on this uh, question. It's also interesting because it doesn't need to have let's say, access to the internal model. And sometimes because it's complex, sometimes because it's hidden for good or bad reasons, you don't have access to the internal mechanics. So what you'd like to know is that, okay, if I feed this model with something that is not really fully expected, what will be the outcome? And typically this could be the kind of question that if you at the higher level decision-making layers, okay, shall I say yes to deploy the systems at a very large scale? This is the kind of question you're interested in. Okay, so for other proxies people, this kind of approach, visual approach, can be also relevant uh, too. So, a few words about the, the, the conclusion. As you have seen, I've tried to illustrate this example, some from my institution, some from other institution. Very recent work, so the oldest, oldest one was four years old, and the most recent one was this year. So. In the VIS community, there's now incre an increasing number of people in tracks, in conferences, also starting to think about using what has been done in the last decade in the VIS domain to support the AI domain. And the, uh, I believe that, yes, indeed, for various problems, maybe internal mechanics, maybe building surrogate models, maybe explaining one single result, sensitivity analysis of a whole model, this can be a good approach because it's visual, because it's most of the time easy to understand as long as the this is trustworthy, which is also an important problem. So, uh, I think that uh, when we say that we should build systems that are trustworthy for the citizen, the final user, the patient, we should not forget the proxies people because these are the people that are in contact, in direct contact with the final user. If those proxies people don't understand, if they don't trust, if they don't convince the right message, obviously the final one will never accept it. And it may be doctors, judges, engineers, bankers, recruitment officers. Same applies to all those emerging things about AI supported recruitment processes. Again, if I take the two examples, if I'm an applicant, I want to know why my application has been rejected, on which basis, explainability of that. If I'm the HR director of a big multinational, I want to know if I 
should accept or not this, the deployment of the system, the broadest value. If we're talking about policymakers, at least two questions arise. AI-based governments, so to which extent do we allow or support or promote governance based on AI to set up policies, for instance? And a second linked question is the governance of AI as such, and we have seen there's a lot of initiatives around that, but to which extent should it be regulated? It will be one day. How it will be regulated, I don't know, but for sure one day there will be, let's say, more pressure about regulating, let's say, those kind of uh, techniques. So, visualization is emerging, I've illustrated with some example, as a mean to support AI experts. It's there, it starts to be, let's say, accepted to some extent, so I'm pretty sure that for AI experts, this will play a bigger role. But it's only a very small part of the population. It should also be more widely used to support the proxy people, and it's just emerging. So to help them to better understand what's, what this model is really doing. Because otherwise they will not be able to take the decision, they will not be able to communicate about what is really behind the box and uh, ultimately to lead to a wider acceptance. And, uh, okay, people in the, in the interface are key in the adoption process. And as I've told you, you don't need to understand our dynamics to take your flight back home. Thank you.